Some of London's finest restaurants are in Soho's Charlotte Street. Tim O'Leary's customers come by cab and in fine cars, so who had come to visit him in this one? He was never to find out. The wreck just sat there for five whole weeks. The copper on the beat didn't seem wildly interested. The wreck went on sitting there and sitting and sitting. Some people got some pleasure out of it. Some of them even took bits of it away, but not enough for Mr. O'Leary. Outside his door, it was also in his hair and on his nerves. Nobody could deliver direct to his restaurant, either goods or customers. And sightseers brought no business. The dustmen weren't best pleased either at having to hump Mr. O'Leary's mini bins that much further. And so the weeks went by. A little story hardly worth the telling if Mr. O'Leary's spot of bother was unique, but it isn't. All over the country, hundreds of derelict cars are being dumped by the roadside every week, and it's going to get worse. By 1970, there may be 700,000 cars a year being junked. What's being done? The police rarely only come into it if they think there's an obstruction or suspect theft. It's a matter for the local authority, and some take their responsibilities seriously. Croydon even has its own breaking and bailing yard, which is beginning to pay for itself. Other authorities have arrangements with private scrapyards. Trouble is, most of them charge a towing away fee, and many derelict car owners can't or won't pay up. Hence this, and hence some very angry citizens. This wreck had lain here for weeks. Within 24 hours of the slogans appearing, it was taken away and another with it. Coincidence, of course. Yet the old car that nobody wants to know is big business. Big? Well, behind this clothesline is one of Britain's biggest industries. It's called the waste recovery trade, and the scrap metal section alone earns over 84 million pounds a year. It can be carried on by a couple of men at the side of a road, or in a small yard like this, where the totters, rag and bone men, bring the proceeds of their house-to-house -house collections. This is probably the most efficient operation of the lot. Metal, rags, bones, glass, paper, everything is sorted and resold. Nothing wasted. Or in a huge scrapyard like this one at Waltham Cross, believed to be Europe's biggest. If you can get your old car here, they'll take it without charge but they can't afford to collect it for nothing, although its final scrap value may be as much as eight pounds. Why? Well, it's the processing involved. First, the car has to be fired. All the wood and upholstery burnt out, all the non-ferrous metals, copper tubing and the like, disposed of. Newer cars are a different proposition. They'll even buy those for the value of the spares. Then the wreck has to be cut into manageable sections, more labor costs. The cut sections then have to be transported to the crusher. Here, at last, machinery takes over, squashing and bashing the scrap into uniform bales, ready for the journey to the steelworks. The whole long, expensive process could be fully automated. They do it in the States, they do it in Japan, but the capital costs are enormous and few in Britain have been willing or able to meet them but there are signs of change, and here is one of them. It's the world's largest car crusher, designed in America, but built in Britain, now being demonstrated for the first time. It'll travel the country, call at the dumping grounds, and crush up to a thousand cars a week, sometimes two at a time. Here, it's having a go at an entire car, 
wheels, engine and all. But it won't normally do this. In any case, the resulting mixture would be almost useless for scrap. The derelicts will still have to be burnt and stripped, so much of the problem will remain unsolved. Fully automated car disposal is still in the future, in Britain anyway. Go down almost any country lane and you'll realize cars aren't the only things people throw away. Any country lover will tear his hair at this sight and it's only too distressingly familiar. As people get richer, they buy more and throw away more. But there's really no need to throw it here. Every council has a duty to dispose of all household refuse. But for the big stuff, many of them charge and some householders would rather dump than stump up. And then there's fly tipping, the illegal disposal of rubble. Builders pay contractors to cart the stuff away, but some drivers will dump their loads anywhere rather than drive perhaps 20 miles to an official tip. They're hard to catch. In Brent, where we are now, the council spends 2,000 a year fencing open land and cleaning up after fly tippers. Yet there have been only two prosecutions in two years. Total fines five pounds, hardly enough to pay for the broken pavements. But every householder has a dumping problem. In Birmingham, he's lucky. One of these gleaming monsters arrives at the drop of a postcard. They're specially designed to cope with a three-piece suite, the old fridge, the lot, as well as dealing with the normal household refuse. Yes, they'll take the old clock as well, and they won't charge a penny piece for any of it. Of course, you pay for it on the rates, but that doesn't seem quite the same. And no one is tempted to throw their junk into someone else's garden to avoid paying a charge. At the depot, the big pieces go into the incinerator. Let's hope Granny hasn't sewn her savings into the old armchair. But should it all be burnt? Couldn't part at least be salvaged? The metal, this time the old fridge, follows the familiar process and may in time become part of a new fridge. It'll also be part of the 100,000 a year Birmingham earns from selling its salvage. But what about all this? 350 tons daily in this one depot alone. Some of it gets sorted, but the rest burnt. Britain only salvages a quarter of her waste paper, yet that's the annual equivalent of a forest the size of Holland. There's nothing that can't be salvaged and used again. The tin coating on these cans is worth 1,000 pounds a ton, but only one or two firms exist who can separate it, so it's lost. The problem is double-edged. Finding the space to take the ever-increasing lumber of our civilization now come to such a pitch that a hole in the ground is a very saleable property, and finding new methods of salvage. The scrapyards, the totters, the gypsies do the best they can, but it's not enough. Too much literally goes down the drain or up in smoke. But paradoxically, our waste is a real part of our wealth.